my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing cross. the word hallelujah is the one word and that's spoken in any language that anybody can understand doesn't matter if you speak Spanish doesn't matter if you speak Hawaiian doesn't matter if you speak Chinese Tagal it doesn't matter if you say hallelujah everybody knows what you're saying in any place in the world isn't that cool and hallelujah just means praise the Lord and uh, he's worthy of our praise man praise the Lord that's right he, he gave us a breath of life. Man, he gave us this beautiful day. <clears throat> it's a good day for him to come back, yeah? Well, if you have your Bibles, if you would, please, turn to the book of Luke, chapter number 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter number 15. I'm so glad you guys came here today. And I hope you get a blessing out of the service today. Matthew chapter number 15, I'm sorry, Luke chapter number 15, and uh, verse number 11. The Bible says, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portions of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after that, the younger 
son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And I wonder who sent that famine. You know, that's a good study to do in your Bible, the studies of famines. There's 13 of them found in the Bible, and every single one of them had a purpose by God to draw people closer to God. <clears throat> There's a, uh, how many's keeping up with the news and you hear about the locusts that are over in Africa and it's creating a famine over there and people are beginning to uh, they can't find food and water because these these locusts just keep multiplying and multiplying and they, they're just wiping out everything in Africa <clears throat> verse number 15 and it says and uh, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine and he would have have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to, and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise, and I will go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And the Bible says, but when he was yet a great way off, the father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And before he even got to say, make me as one of thy hired servants, the father interrupted him in verse number 22, and the father says, But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring thither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for loving us. Lord, we wouldn't even know what love is if it wasn't for the fact that you loved us so much that you came into this world and shed your blood on the cross of Calvary for our sins, Lord. All you, The Bible says that all you had to do without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. All you had to do was shed your blood, but you went way beyond that. You died on the cross. You suffered anguish and shame and humiliation and died up there naked and went through a mock trial and people spit on you and punched you in the face and plucked out your beard and set a crown of thorns upon your head, Lord. And you went way beyond just shedding your blood to prove to us how much you did love us. The wrath of God was poured out upon you. You suffered hell in our place. You suffered death in our place, Lord, and we thank you so much for that. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation you so freely given, Lord. Cost us nothing, but it cost you everything. Lord, may we just give you thanks and praise here today. Lord, I ask you to do what I cannot possibly do, and that is to speak to the hearts of everybody who's gathered here, listening to your word, Lord. Move in our hearts, Lord. I pray if there's somebody who's came and in this service, Lord, and they don't know you as their personal Savior, Lord, I pray that you send conviction upon that soul and give them the courage, Lord, to put their faith and trust in you. Maybe there's somebody who is here, Lord, that, Lord, is like this prodigal son and has strayed away from you and found themselves in a far country. Lord, I pray today be the day they come back home and find your arms wide open welcoming them. Lord, we ask all this for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as I read this story about the, we call it the prodigal son, I really think it's a story about the father. Uh, this father pictures our heavenly father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, this son uh, pictures me and you. And uh, as I read this story, I see uh, several different scenes in this story. The first scene that I see is a wounded scene. I mean, can you imagine this son? He comes up to his father and he says, Father, give me my inheritance. Give me what, uh, what's coming to me. And the father, wisely enough, gave it to him. He gave him the, the, his portion of inheritance. Can you imagine somebody doing that? 15, 16-year-old kid going up to their dad and saying, Dad, I want my inheritance that you're going to give me when you die right now. <laughs> Just give it to me right now. Can you imagine that? That's what this boy did to his father. 
And then he took his inheritance. He took all that, that money that his father had given him. And instead of investing it, instead of building a house, instead of starting a family, the Bible says that he went off into a far country. And he wasted all that, wasted all that substance with riotous living. Man, he went and he lived the party life. Man, he had his friends, he had the nightclubs, he had the drugs, he had the, you name it, all the bling that the devil could offer, all everything this world could offer, man. He spent up all of his money doing that. And as I read this uh, story, I think, man, how much that must have wounded the heart of his father. I mean, here he gave this boy his inheritance, <clears throat> which, which was a sad thing in, in itself just for him to ask for it. And then he runs away from home, spends it all up with righteous living. Man, how that must have wounded the heart of the father. And as I read this story and see this wounded scene, I'm reminded that we have a heavenly father. And I think sometimes his heart gets wounded. You know, <clears throat> everything you have comes from God. Everything you have comes from God. I mean, the air you breathe comes from God. The food that you have comes from God. You say, well, my food didn't come from God. I had a Spam Musubi this morning. That didn't come from God. Well, yes, it did. You say, no, it came from 7-Eleven. Well, where did 7-Eleven get it? Well, they, they got the Spam Musubi from canned ham, I guess. <laughs> and they got the rice uh, from the fields, right? <clears throat> and, and, well, where did that come from? Well, pro some of the ham probably came from a pig. <laughs> the rice came from the fields. Well, where did that come from? Well, that came from God. Everything you have comes from God. The air you breathe, the clothes on your back, the friends you have, it, all of it comes from God. The Bible says that every gift cometh from above from the Father of lights. Every good thing in your life comes from God. Your parents, your friends, your family, it, it doesn't matter. It all comes from God. And you know what our attitude is a lot of times? Our attitude is this towards God. We may not say it audibly to Him, Sometimes we say this, God, I want what you have, but I don't want you. I don't want your rules. I don't want your regulations. I don't want your word. I don't want your, I, I just want what you have. I want your food. I want your air. I want your money. I want your, what you have so I can use it for myself, but I don't want you. And I think that hurts the heart of God, just like it hurt this father for his son to have asked him like that. Can you imagine? people, God is God's so gracious. God's a giver. I mean, every time you see him in the Bible, he's given. For God so loved the world that he gave. I mean, he gave you the very best thing that he had, his own precious son. The Bible says, if he did not so freely give you, if he did not give you his son, will he not so freely give you all things? And he'll give you anything. He gave us this world. He gave us this ocean. He gave us these mountains. He gave us this air. He gave us everything. And sometimes we say, God, I want what you have, but I don't want you. You just stay out of my life. I don't want you popping your nose in my life and finding out what's going on and what I'm doing with this money and what I'm doing with this time and what I'm doing with what you've given me. It's mine. I've taken it. I want the portions of goods that fall to me, and I'm going to take it and do what I want. Man, that must break God's heart to see his children treat him that way. Not only do I see a wounded scene, but I see a wasted scene. Uh, the Bible says that this, this prodigal son, he took the portions of goods that were befalleth to him, and he went into a far country and there wasted his substance. He wasted it. Wasted it away. Wasted it with riotous living. <clears throat> I preached a message one time on uh, dragons, how they inhabit wastelands in the Bible. You go through the book of Isaiah, you go through the book of Jeremiah, it talks about these dragons, and they're always in these wastelands. And so my message was, what's the wastelands in your life? A wasted day, a wasted mind, a wasted childhood, a wasted marriage, a waste, you fill in the blank. What's wasted? <clears throat> How much has God given you that you just wasted? That's what this man did. Man, he had, he had this portion of goods, and he took it around and spent it all on himself. He wanted the good life. And you know what? The devil paints a beautiful picture, but his picture's not real. Man, he paints this fantastic picture of come live for me and you'll have 
the bling, you'll have the party life, you'll have the girls, you'll have the cars, you'll have the, the nightlife, and it's going to be a fun life. And yes, sin is pleasurable for a season, the Bible says. It's fun. Sin is fun. But just like a season, it comes to an end. You know, we have uh, spring and winter and summer. Well, here in Hawaii, we just have summer and hotter summer and hotter summer and then back to regular summer again. But we have seasons. And one thing you can count on in a season is that it's going to come to an end and a new season is going to start. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11, that sin is pleasurable for a season. That means it's coming to an end. And yeah, it might be fun. Yeah, it might be a party. Yeah, it might, you might enjoy it. But when it comes to an end, you're going to have to pay the price. The Bible says in the book of 1 John, that when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. I don't care what kind of sin it is. There's a price tag on it, and that's death. You know, when in my flesh, the Bible says, dwelleth no good thing. <clears throat> Man, if, if you just left me to myself, I would be up to no good. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'd do. That's what Kevin would do. That's what any of us would do, because in our flesh dwelleth no good thing. Well, here's the thing. The devil cannot make you sin. He, can't, he doesn't have that power. He cannot force somebody to sin. But what he does do is tempt us. He tempts us with the things of this world. He's the God of this world, and he tempts us with the things of this world. And what happens is when that temptation meets my lust, sin is conceived, just like a baby. And, you know, babies are harmless uh, you know, but then one day they grow up and they could grow up to be an axe murderer. <laughs> That's like sin. Sin seems harmless when it first comes around, but then it grows up and it comes, <clears throat> comes, comes back to you looking for retribution, looking for a payment. Sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. I don't care what kind of sin you do, at the end of the road, that sin is going to cause death. I mean, good night, man. You take somebody who, who kills somebody, and you follow their life all the way down to the end of the road, and you know what you have? More death. You take somebody who's an alcoholic, you f follow their life all the way down to the end of the road, you have death. You have death. You take somebody who, who is into drugs, man, you follow their life. Death, death. You take somebody who tells lies. You follow their life all the way down to the end of the road, you have death. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. And not just any death. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelations that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So if we were to die in our sins, we have a payment coming to us, a wage, and that's death. Not just death, but death and hell. And that's horrible. <clears throat> that's what happens to every single human being that walks the face of this planet. Because we've all sinned. We all have this wage coming to us. And here this young man, he wasted his substance. Wasted it away. <clears throat> the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter number 17, that he who is slothful is kin to him that is a waster. That waste, wasted time, wasted day, wasted life, wasted mind. That's what this uh, young man did. He he came to the end of the road, and he had nothing. And you know what happened when he had nothing? All of his friends left him. Hey, man, that's what happens in our life. When you come down to rock bottom, where's your friends? Where's your family? Where's those who said that they were going to stick by you? And they're gone. When the money's out, they're out. <laughs> that's the way it works, isn't it? <clears throat> and here this man, he found himself with nothing. And so he went to the worst possible place you could go to, a pig's pen. And the Jewish people had nothing to do with pigs. They thought that they were unclean animals. They thought that they were, it was sacrilege to even be around one of them, yet alone raise one. And this guy, he said, man, I got to have some kind of, of livelihood. I got to have some kind of money. I got to have some kind of food to put in my belly or I'm going to die. So he humbled himself and started working in a pig pen, joined himself to a citizen of that country, the Bible says, and started feeding the swine. And here he is in that pig pen. I don't know if you've ever been around pigs, man, but they stink. When I was a little kid, uh, my next door neighbor bought a pot pig. And it was cool at first, 
but he put his fence right up or put his cage right up against the fence which was right by my window <laughs> and uh man that thing stunk and i remember coming home from school going to my room and i'd have to shut all the windows i mean it was so bad pigs stink can you imagine working with a bunch of pigs man they stink and all that slop and then reaching down into that nasty trough picking up that slop and eating the husks that the pigs did eat that's what he was eating man that's that pig pen describes this world now this whole world out here is nothing but a big pig pen and all they have to offer you to eat is slop there's nothing good that they have offered you I mean he sat there in this pig pen and then he had a moment of clarity and he thought man my my father has bread on his table and his servants have plenty of bread enough to spare. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to my father's house and I'm going to say, hey, dad, listen, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But if you just make me as one of thy hired servants, I'll, I'll work for you. I'll work out in the fields. Just I can't, I can't take this life anymore. I see a, a wounded scene. I see a wasted scene. <clears throat> and then I see another scene. A rejoicing scene a wonderful scene he sits down and he he gets up by the way there has to come a time in our life where we're not satisfied with this world anymore and so we want to do something about it and we got to get up out of our situation and make our way to our Heavenly Father come back to him and that's what he did he started down that road towards his father and the Bible says that while he was yet a great way off, the Father saw him. You know why he saw him? Because he never quit looking for him. And the Bible says that he had compassion on him. Man, that's one of the hallmarks of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time you see him in the Bible, he's moved with compassion. He sees the multitude and he has compassion on them. I mean, he is marked by compassion. Aren't you glad you serve a God? That's compassionate. Man, he knows where you are. He, he hasn't taken his eyes off of you. He knows that our frame is but dust. He, he understands where you are and what you need. He loves you. Man, that's the greatest theology in all the Bible right there is that God loves you. God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that's anybody, that believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The father saw him, had compassion, and the Bible says that he ran to meet him. Man, the Bible says in the book of James, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. And you start moving towards God and guess what? He's going to start moving towards you. And here is the only type that we see in the Bible of God the father running, running to somebody because they, he loves him so much. And he's not going to just walk. He's running to meet him. And when you make that move towards God and you start walking to him, man, he starts running to you, to meet you. And man, his steps are a whole lot bigger than our steps. And the Bible says he got to him and he fell on him. And he kissed him. Oh, man, the kisses of God. Man, when God kisses you, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like being in his presence. There's nothing like being smothered in his love. And can you imagine how this boy smelt? Man, he smelt like the pig pen. I'm sure he looked like the pig pen. I'm sure he was covered in all the mud of the world. He was covered in the slop of these pigs. And here his father is kissing him, falling on him and kissing him. And then he says, <clears throat> let's have a feast. Bring hither the fatted calf. And then he took a ring and he put it on his finger. This ring right here is my wedding ring. And... Uh, my wife gave it to me, and I gave her one, and it symbolizes our commitment to each other. I'm going to be with her forever till death do us part. In sickness and healthness, in sickness and pain, and, and, and we're going to be through health, through wealth. We're going to be with each other till our, till we die, till we separate. And this is a symbol of our commitment. You know what? God has put a ring on our finger. It's the Holy Spirit. That's that's His down payment. That's his commitment to us that he said, I go away. Whither I go, I cannot tell you. But, but when I come again, I will come for you. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. I mean, he's promised us something. 
And he's given us an investment, his spirit. And then he put a robe on his back. Man, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ took off my filthy robes of unrighteousness. And he replaced them with his robes of righteousness. And when God looks at me, he doesn't see Kevin anymore. But he sees what God has done, what his son has purchased with his own precious blood. He sees me just as pure, just as holy, just as perfect as his son, Jesus Christ. Even though I still mess up, even though I still fall down, even though I fall short of the glory of God, yet he doesn't see that anymore because I'm one of his. And he's put his robes of righteousness on me. And then he put shoes on his feet. Man, I'm so glad about that. He didn't just save me and leave me here in this world, but he gave me something to do. He gave me a job to do. And he sent me over here to Hawaii. He sent me over here to Waimanalo Beach Park. He sent me over to uh, the RAM program. He sent, me, he sent me somewhere. He gave me a job to do. Man, I'm so glad that I can serve the Lord. He put shoes on my feet. And listen, God has a job for you to do. God has something very specific that he wants you to do. He created you. And by the way, God didn't create any accidents. He created you for a special purpose, something that only you can do, something that you can do that I'll never be able to do, a very specific purpose. He's given you a pair of shoes and says, come, come and work for me. I got a job for you, son. And then they, they made Mary. Oh, man, there's nothing like the joy of the Lord. When it enters your heart. Man, you know, <clears throat> I'm glad it says the joy of the Lord and not the happiness of the Lord. <laughs> happiness is just temporary. Man, one day I could be happy and the next day I could be sad. One day I could be happy and, and laughing and stuff and the next day I could get news from the doctor that everything's going wrong and I'm not going to be so happy anymore. It's temporal. Uh, one day I could be happy and going out to eat on Valentine's Day with my wife and having a nice time. And the next day I could be broke and I could be sad. <laughs> because happiness is temporal. But joy, that's something that he gives you that lasts forever. Man, I can lay my head down on my pillow at night and know that I know that I know that I'm not going to hell. I can know that I've got a place in heaven because he's given me his word on it. And that gives me joy. Man, you can strip everything from me. You could take everything I have, but you can't take away my joy. You, you, I mean, the devil could cause, like he did Job, and cause boils to sh show up on his skin to where he's sitting in the ashes, scraping himself with potsherd, but you can't take away his joy. The devil can't take away joy. The world can't take away joy that God gives. Not only that, but he gives a peace. A peace that surpasseth all understanding. I can't even, even explain the peace that I have. When you're right, when you're in the will of God, when you're a child of God and you know you're on your way to heaven, man, God just gives you that peace. Everything's going to be all right, child, because I'm here. Like my, my kids, man, we're, we're, we could be in a terrible situation. Uh, and and, and we, I remember we were in New York and I hit black ice and our car was just spinning all over the place, went off the side of the road into a, uh, into a bunch of uh, uh, snow. And my kids... They just knew Dad got it. It's okay. Dad's going to get us out of here. And uh, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> but I got out, and some people pulled off the side of the road and helped me get my van out, and we were out of there in like 15 minutes. <clears throat> but you know what? We have that peace with God. My father's got it. And he, whatever situation I come across, man, he's got it. He's going to take care of me. He's going to come through it every time. And, and even when he puts us in the hard places, we know that that's just for our own benefit. That's just to mature us. That's just to strengthen us so that we can go on and climb the next mountain. Aren't you glad you have a heavenly father like that? So I see in this story a wounded scene. And we've all wounded the heart of our father at some point in time. And then I see a wasted scene, and we've wasted our lives. We've wasted what God has given us. But then I see a wonderful scene. We could always go back to him, and he'll always be there for us. I like what it says in the book of Jonah. It said after Jonah had messed up, and he, God told him to go to Nineveh, but he went the other direction and went to Tarshish, and he ended up 
getting swallowed by a whale. Remember the story? And the whale spit him up on the beach. And the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Oh, man, I love that. We serve a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances and a thousandth chances. The Bible says that a just man falleth seven times but riseth up again. You know, every time I fall down and mess up, I keep getting back up and going. Why? Because the Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter number four, verse number two, that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. I keep getting back up and keep going towards him because he is so good to me. And if you'll be honest with yourself, you'd have to say, man, he's been good to me too. No matter what situation you're in, no matter what point of life you're in, God has grace for you. He has more grace for you. He has goodness for you. He's good to you. He is good to you. One day when we get to heaven, when we look back on this life, we'll have to say, wow, God, it could have been a whole lot worse. But you were good to me. I think about the guy who got the new car. And somebody looked at that new car and they said, man... I wish I had a car like that. All I got is this old clunker. Somebody looked at him and said, Man, I wish I had a car. All I've got is this moped. Somebody looked at him and said, Man, you're lucky you got a moped. All I got is a bicycle. Somebody looked at him and said, Man, I wish I had a bicycle. All I got is these tennis shoes. Somebody looked at him and said, Man, I wish I had legs. God's been good to us. I don't think we just realize how good we have it. God's a good God. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you. And I thank you, Lord, for loving me. And Lord, I thank you for each person that came out here to Waimanalo Beach Park to hear your word. And I wonder with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, nobody looking around, maybe you'd say, hey, I'm not saved. Would you pray for me that I would be saved? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. All I'm going to do is pray for you. Is there anybody like that? Please pray for me. I'm not saved, but I want to be. Anybody like that? Maybe you'd say, hey, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven, but I kind of feel like maybe this prodigal son. I've wandered away from God, but I want to come home. I want to come back to him. Hey, you can do that right now. You, you know, you can wander a thousand miles away from God and all you have to do is turn around and He's right there. You can't get too far away from God. He's always, He's seen Him while He was a great ways off because He never took His eyes off of Him. And God has never taken His eyes off of you. He knows right where you are. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what you need. And He's just waiting for you to come home. Maybe today you'll take that first step out of that pig pen start your way home to meet the Father. The Bible says, draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh unto you. Yeah, you stay in that far country and you'll never find Him. But you get up and you start making your way to Him. The Bible says, Jesus said this, if any man come to me, I will in no wise cast him out. That's a promise from God. If you come to Him, He's not going to turn you away, but He's going to accept you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this time. Lord, thank you for these people. Lord, I pray, Lord, that when we leave this place, Lord, that you'll continue to work in hearts, Lord, and may you do something special here in Waimanalo, Lord. May we start a church here, and may we see many people come to know you. And Lord, may we see some warriors, Lord, for your cause, Lord, here in this place. Lord, we ask all this for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you guys for coming out. We're going to pray for the food. Uh, Brother Gail, you want to pray for the food? <clears throat> Amen.